Good evening, everyone. A very well, warm welcome from Jerusalem, and thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Sethill, and I manage Geshe Europa, A Bridge to Europe, an initiative which connects the National Library, our collections, and our people to Europe. So I'm really delighted to announce this session, introduce this session, New Realities of Jewish Heritage in Europe, with my friend and colleague, Ruth Ellen Gruber, and her brother, Dr. Sam Gruber. Whilst the trigger for this event is the 10th anniversary of Jewish Heritage Europe, the website, which has become the one-stop shop for all news and events about Jewish heritage across Europe, which Ruth created and manages single-handedly, we are really celebrating many more decades of Ruth's passion for her writing and teaching about Jewish heritage and contemporary Jewish life in Europe. So much of the National Library's rich collections of material culture archives, books, manuscripts, music, and much more have their origins in Europe. So this is an important opportunity to reflect on the places, the built heritage from which they came, and to hear how to create engagement with and better understanding of this fascinating dimension of European history and culture. I also want to mention that both Gesha Europa and Jewish Heritage Europe were developed and are funded by Rothschild Foundation Hanatib Europe, which creates another connection for our work along the Jewish heritage continuum. It's an added pleasure to be able to host Ruth together with Sam. I think this is the first time we've had siblings present together on any of our cultural events. So now to introduce our speakers. Ruth Ellen Gruber is a journalist, author, editor, and researcher. She has published and lectured widely and won awards for many of her works on Jewish heritage and contemporary Jewish issues in Europe, as well as on the European fascination and embrace of the American Wild West, its mythology and its music. I think that needs to be another event for us. She has chronicled European Jewish issues for more than 30 years and coined the term virtually Jewish, to describe the way the so-called Jewish space in, in Europe is often filled by non-Jews. Currently, Ruth runs the website Jewish Heritage Europe, an online resource for Jewish heritage issues that is the project, as I've said, of the Rothschild Foundation Hanadi of Europe. Dr. Sam Gruber is an expert on Jewish art, architecture, and the historic preservation of Jewish sites and monuments and has been a leader in the documentation, protection, and preservation of historical Jewish sites worldwide for 30 years. Since 2001, he has been a lecturer in Jewish studies at Syracuse University, where he teaches courses on Jewish art and architecture. Sam was founding director of the Jewish Heritage Program of World Monuments Fund, and was research director of the US Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad from 1998 through 2008. He presently directs Gruber Heritage Global, a cultural resource consulting firm, and is president of the not-for-profit International Survey of Jewish Monuments. Sam, I'm handing over to you. Many thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I hope you, hope you can hear me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be doing this program with the library, and of course, uh, a special pleasure to be the uh, interlocutor uh, for my sister, Ruth. Um, I've, obviously, I've known her all my life, uh, but we've also worked together um, now and then uh, a lot over the past uh, 30 years. Ruth has had a distinguished career as an award-winning journalist before she really turned her sights on to the reporting uh, needs of, of Jewish heritage. Um, and during... Um, her, her work, uh, we've run sort of parallel courses as your introduction suggested, but we do enjoy crossing paths regularly. And in fact, this summer, we both um, traveled a bit for a few weeks in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, something we've been doing off and on for, for many uh, decades. But um, where I am mostly involved in uh, a kind of academic approach, uh, Ruth, um, has a very different role to play, a very important role to play in the documentation, protection, preservation, and presentation and uh, coordination of Jewish heritage projects in Europe. And she does that so wonderfully through the website, Jewish Heritage Europe, uh, which we're going to talk about 
uh, very soon. So Ruth, uh, let me start the questioning by asking you a very obvious question. What is Jewish Heritage Europe, the website? And uh, then we can go into a little bit more detail about what Jewish heritage is in Europe, apropos the website and other, uh, other areas of, uh, of uh, endeavor. And you need to unmute. Uh, thanks, Sam, and thanks, Karen. Uh, it's great to be here, um, even virtually. Uh, Jewish Heritage Europe is a, an online web portal, and it's, we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of its current version. Um, it grew out of a previous version of Jewish Heritage Europe, which sought to present information about Jewish heritage and monuments all over Europe that had become inactive for various reasons. And um, our current version, which I've been developing, uh, not totally, so, not totally single-handedly, um, went online 10 years ago. And it's a combination of uh, what we call static content and dynamic content. So on one level, it's like a library, an online library of information and links and descriptive material and <clears throat> um, to Jewish heritage sites, physical sites, built heritage uh, in 48 countries around the continent. And the dynamic content is a series of posts, articles, photographs, constantly updated material, trying to present a picture of what's going on in the Jewish heritage world, in the Jewish built heritage world, because we deal with built heritage, brick, stone, wood, mortar, physical sites, not community building um, and not, uh, not so much Judaica or things like that, although museums are also within our purview. So um, I think the dynamic content is really what makes Jewish Heritage Europe special. And of course, that's what changed it from that earlier iteration, which was, I was part of that effort and it was Charmin Kaddish, Sid Greenberg, uh, some other people, and also sponsored by, by Rothschild Hanadiv. And that was, you know, it was an attempt to be almost encyclopedic and, and we didn't have the journalistic skills that you brought to the project. Um, it seems to me that what you've created that is so special and new is essentially a new service for Jewish heritage uh, projects, uh, something that didn't, did not exist before. We have uh, you know, the Jewish Encyclopedia, we have the Index of Jewish Art, we have other web-based data collections, but yours is the only, um, is the only forum really for constantly uh, updated news reports about projects in how many countries do you serve? How many countries are represented in all? Uh, 48 countries in what's considered Europe from UK to, I don't know, Georgia, something like that. 48 right. countries. And I mean, some of these countries, some of these countries, you know, are, are the Vatican City, which has a museum <laughs> exhibition and Andorra, which has something small, but um, the, the idea is to, well, it's what you said, there's, there's, there's so much information out there. Uh, the idea is to have updated information about what is happening and it's impossible to have everything. It's impossible to, to, to you know, even to, even, even to wade through the amount of material that, that is out there. And so we supplement um, what goes on the website with Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, which adds more material that we just can't fit into the website. So let me um, ask, uh, why does it matter? Um, obviously, I use it all the time. It's very important to stay abreast of what's going on in different places. And But, but what does it matter to uh, the general public? And what does it matter to different audiences? Who uses Jewish Heritage Europe and what do they find there? I, I think we have a, a variety <laughs> I of audiences. I mean, you know, I could, I can, I can, uh, you know, I can use Google Analytics to get some sort of idea, but we have a variety of audiences and there's a variety of target audiences. 
I think one of the things that I think is most important about what we do is to create a network and to, to allow people who are working on projects in one country or in one city or in one village to, to search on the website and find examples or find inspiration, find successful or unsuccessful projects that people have done in a similar fashion. Uh, I, I wanna connect the dots. I want to connect people. And even though it may seem impossible that someone in Georgia can learn from a project that's going on in Spain or a project in Poland can learn from something that's going on in Italy. No, if you learn 5%, if you get some sort of idea uh, and inspiration, um, even, even a sense of, of, of hope that you can accomplish something, this is, this is part of the this is part of the idea of Jewish Heritage Europe, to show the, the very large extent of what's going on. Some of our users are, are hands-on protagonists in the field. Others are virtual travelers who want to learn about places that they might want to go. Um, one of the things that, that I try to do is to make what we put on the website accurate because there's a tremendous amount of disinformation and, um, you know, I would say sort of sentiment and sentimental disinformation. You know, oh, this is the largest Jewish cemetery. I, you know, this is the oldest synagogue in Europe. This is the largest, and, and it's, it's not what's, what's, what's there. So we try to make everything that we put on the website accurate to have a sort of, um, you know, point of reference, to be a point of reference for, for projects and for, and for material. Right. I know, you know, in your earlier career, you were a journalist, uh, a bureau chief for Associated Press and United Press nope. International. United you, Press you, International. You, okay, United Press International. But you bring, uh, you bring a, a kind of, you bring a high level of uh, journalistic, not just competence, but standards to the work. And the internet, of course, has been a great boon. And I think it's one of the reasons that, uh, uh, I mean, you, 10 years ago, it was the right moment to make a success of this. But also, as you say, the internet is a, um, uh, can be a curse because it spreads, uh, it does spread false information and, and, and rumors. I wanna, I wanna ask you about um, more broad uh, heritage questions. Uh, you've been very active in linking uh, people working in Jewish heritage projects to broader cultural heritage um, projects. At the recent conference in Krakow, uh, it was very wonderful and unusual that there were speakers coming from outside of the Jewish heritage world who were presented, people working on religious property preservation in Europe uh, for different denominations. How do you think that uh, the links are there, the important links, but also what do you think differentiates, really separates the the situation and maybe the, the problems and potential solutions with Jewish heritage sites from, from the more mainstream majority uh, culture uh, heritage uh, 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 themes and in, in, in needs in Europe today? I think, well, the Holocaust, to put it bluntly. Um, I, I was very happy to, to have at that conference uh, a session on Jewish heritage in Europe, who's it for? And all of the people came from projects that are outside of the normal uh, Jewish heritage world. Um, and I, when I discuss, you know, there are many similarities. There are thousands of vacant churches. You know, there are, there are, Jew there are uh, Christian cemeteries, mainstream cemeteries that need a lot of work. But when I discuss this with, colleagues, um, I have to make the distinction that, yes, churches which don't have, a, which are empty now and abandoned, it's mainly in much of Europe or most of Europe due to dwindling congregations in countries like in the, in the UK and Denmark and Netherlands, it's, it's lack, of, lack of religious communities that are growing, they're dwindling. Um, it's a normal demographic shift that is causing these churches to be let's say abandoned, but in, in much of Europe, if not most of Europe, the synagogues that are abandoned and ruined turned into other types of use, that's be, was due to deliberate destruction. 
it's a very different it's a very different uh, uh, like like a basis for 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 having these these places that need the work that need the care and when I think of them I I wrote a book once twenty well. 1994, called Upon the Doorposts of Thy House, in which I described the, the physical traces of Jewish Heritage Europe, the synagogues, cemeteries, mikvah, all of this, as, as symbolic mezuzahs, because they, are, they mark places where Jews once lived but no longer live, just like the mezuzah on the door uh, of a Jewish home marks a home where Jews live. And these are you know, these sites are tangible talismans to a past that was before the Holocaust and before communism, because many sites were, were destroyed under communism after the war. And besides being this sort of tangible talisman, taking one back and really anchoring discussion and anchoring a sort of um, knowledge or, or understanding of, of, of history and heritage, they're also survivors. The human survivor generation is fast fading away. And what we have left are buildings, which are also survivors. These are survivors of the entire Jewish society and world that existed before the Holocaust. And they, they can make the, the direct connection. And I think that's also important to remember and to consider. Mute. I want to come back. I want to come back to that because I think that's such an important uh, bridge. Um, and and talking about the 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 kind of natural, if we can use that term, demographic change, you know, in in other denominations in Europe, those that were not directly affected by the Holocaust, that we see that largely with the Jewish uh, heritage sites in the United States, where you know I work a lot, um, and I, I always say, you know, the problems are often the physical problems are often the same. You know, there's no roof, or you need to to, to take care of the water problem, or uh, you have to find an audience, or you have to come up with decent signage. But the reasons in America are because of opportunity. Jews have moved because of opportunity and left their synagogues behind and built new ones. Whereas, of course, in Europe, it was oppression and murder and uh, total destruction of of a population and a civilization. And I know you like to talk about, and I think this is very, very important, that one of the reasons for paying attention to preservation and saving these places is not just as markers, not just as memorials of the Holocaust, which are very important reasons, but also as these doorways into a thousand year past history of Jews in Europe that is so important. And that our generation growing up, we weren't taught about that. We were taught about the Holocaust, but we weren't taught about what was destroyed. I've heard you say many times, these places tell you about how people died, but not how they lived. Let's 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 teach about Jewish yeah. history. Can you go into that a little bit? What how that concerns you, and some of the ways you see uh, some successful projects uh, doing that today? Yeah, I mean, I let's 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 go directly to the you know the, the big place uh, Auschwitz. Um, I think before the pandemic. Two and a half million people a year were visiting Auschwitz. It was one of the most visited, if not the most visited attraction um, to be found in, in Poland. This Nazi death camp. And uh, school groups and tour groups and individuals, so many people that they had to uh, organize. You know, you, you, well, when we were there four years ago, you were able to go on your own because you went at seven o'clock in the morning, but after a certain hour, you need to go with a group. So many people go. And in some countries, thanks to Holocaust Remembrance Day in January or other dates throughout the year, uh, school children learn about the Holocaust. They learn about the death. They learn about the brutality of how Jews were, were killed in the Holocaust. And I think this is very important, very important to, to know, but they often don't know. They don't, they aren't taught and they, don't find out any other way who Jews are, who Jews were, and what the totality of life and society that, that was destroyed. Um, each of the six million was a person who represented not just him or herself, but generations that went back hundreds of years and of life. And, you know, Sam 
you said once 30 years ago when we were traveling, if you go to a Jewish museum, you might get the impression that all Jews did was sit around and look at menorahs and wait for the Holocaust because there was no information about the life, the, the society and all that. But if you go to Auschwitz or Schwienchen, now you have the opportunity not just to visit and learn from the Auschwitz former death camp Memorial Museum, but you also have the opportunity to visit in the town of Auschwitz, to visit the Auschwitz Jewish Center, which has a museum, which tells the story of the Jewish community that lived there because Auschwitz was a majority Jewish town. I believe it had a, a deputy mayor who was Jewish. There was Jewish business. The, the, the biggest business was the, 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 the Haberfeld Liquor uh, Company. Um, there, were, there were schools, there were clubs, there was all of this life. And the little museum in the Auschwitz Jewish Center, which is located in a, in a complex anchored by the only surviving synagogue in the town, it tells the story of this multifaceted, multi-layered, rich community, not just, not just the horrible story of, of, of the people and their horrible, brutal death, which again, needs to be told, needs to be learned, but it needs to be learned also, what needs to be learned is the enormity of, of the civilization, the life, the society that, that existed beforehand and was also snuffed out. You know, in Poland, it's common to describe the world before the Holocaust, the Jewish world as Atlantis, because almost in the blink of an eye, almost overnight, this entire continent disappeared just the way Atlantis sank into the sea or whatever it did. And, and in a way, it is this still this unknown continent, this unknown history that unfortunately, um, young people and, and sometimes other people aren't taught. They, they don't get to learn about it. They, they learn about the end of this society, the brutal end of the society, but not, not the, the, vital, the vital living part of the society before. And I think, I think these, um, the, 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 the Jewish built heritage, the synagogues, whatever, are, and, the, and the Jewish cemeteries with their epitaphs, with their iconography, with their art, these are good tools and to serve as um, entry points to learn about what was there in the past and to get a fuller picture of the horror of the destruction and the, the, the devastating nature of, of what was destroyed. I'm glad you mentioned, uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, your book upon the doorpost of thy house. I don't think that many people know that book, uh, but it's a very good one. And the chapter, one of the chapters that I love in that book is called Snowbound in Auschwitz. And I've had, I've used it with my students over the years and they've been very uh, affected by it. Um, and I want to give a shout out, you know, you mentioned the Auschwitz Jewish Center. I, I was uh, privileged to be involved in the very beginning of that when Fred the Furrier, Fred Schwartz, uh, had it as a dream and it actually became a reality. And Jewish Heritage Europe, by reading Jewish Heritage Europe and reading the reports over the years about that place, you can really see how a project develops and is successful and all the different, very many strategies that are used to, to survive and expand and how it began as an American project that became a Polish project. And it, it's really a remarkable, a remarkable place. So I wanna echo you, um, but I was just in Greece and I cited that project to colleagues in Greece about they could learn lessons, go to Jewish Heritage Europe, they could learn lessons about how they could develop their own grassroots projects um, and give it layers of meaning and, and, and act activity. Um, so, you know, it's been uh, 30 years since you started uh, documenting all of this in your first book, Jewish Heritage Travel, 10 years since you've been writing thousands of posts on Jewish heritage. You mentioned some of the changes, but what do you think have been the most dramatic changes uh, and what hasn't changed? Uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot of things that haven't changed, but, but just, we can't, you can't do it all, but if you could pull out a few a few things that strike you uh, because you're always on the road. I, how many how many 
weeks of the year are you on the road visiting places? No, like two out of every four? I mean, before the pandemic. Yeah, before the pandemic, half the time at least, I would say. And, um, but yeah. what what is, I mean, we're looking back more than 30 years. The first time, Sam, you'll remember, we, the first Jewish heritage road trip we did was 40, more than 40 years ago, 1978, when we traveled all around Romania with uh, the then chief rabbi, Moses Rosen, and Hanukkah, like that so-called Hanukkiada, visiting far-flung little Jewish communities all over Romania. And if I remember correctly, we were on that for six days with him and we visited 19 Jewish communities, each one with a synagogue. And I, I still have a letter that I wrote to someone after that trip describing the, my wonder and my astonishment at visiting these places and seeing the paintings on the wall and the synagogues in Northern um, Romania, including the town where our uh, grandparents came from and, and describing the, the, the ornate, uh, the ornate sort of Western style synagogues in Transylvania and these, these little painted synagogues in the, in the North and the, you know, the, the, the carvings on the gravestones and all. I mean, I, 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 this, this is a letter that I recently found that I wrote after that trip full of astonishment. And it's the, you know, nowadays I go and visit a lot of these places, not necessarily in Romania where I haven't been for a while, but um, in other countries. I mean, when I first started documenting and, and trying to put on the map these places back in the early nineties, you know, my, my aim was to put them on the map because nobody basically knew where they were. You had just taken up the position as the founding director of the Jewish Heritage Council of the World Monuments Fund. And you had asked me as I was a journalist covering the fall of communism and all. And you had asked me anytime I saw something Jewish to get a photograph and do a little description and send it back to you because there were no inventories. There were no, there were no, there was no comprehensive listing of the Jewish heritage sites there was that were out there in any of these countries of former communist Europe. And um, even not just in former communist Europe, because in Italy in the 80s, uh, when Ani Sacerdoti wrote her guidebook to Jewish heritage in, in um, 1986, she also wrote in, that, in the introduction to that, that she didn't know what was out there. Nobody knew what was out there. So it was this sort of real lack of knowledge that was there. And, and I started sending these things back to you and um, meeting the individuals on the ground because in each of these countries, there were dedicated individuals who made it their mission um, to document Jewish heritage sites under communism, sometimes really risking um, censure or I, I don't know if punishment is the word, but just the displeasure of the regime. And uh, they worked in isolation. And it was one of my, it was yours as well as mine um, goals was to put these people in touch with each other so that they could create a, a network and know that they weren't alone. And this type of network building is still going on today because I think a lot of people still in certain parts of Europe, you know, it's different in certain countries where there has been a development. But in certain places, I think people still feel that they're working alone. And there are now programs in, in Poland, especially to create networks and, and, and put people in contact. There's some very interesting, valuable programs going on in Poland about this. The um, Michael Trayson's Preserving Memory Awards, the Sendler Awards, which uh, the director of the Auschwitz Jewish Center just won this year was, was, was received that award. He, he received it. Um, no, he got, um, yes, he got that, he got that this year. And um, there's the, the School of Dialogue and various other programs that try to, and that try to put these people who still feel they're working in isolation together. But 
back 30 some years ago, it, people really were isolated. And it took, in some cases, a lot of courage to do what they were doing. And uh, now uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot more institutional support, Jewish support. There's still much to do. I mean, there's still places that are in terrible condition, forgotten, undocumented, but there are fewer now than there were 30 years ago, let's put it that way. And there's more institutional, I think, um, desire to, so to try to, you, to get them together. Let me pick up yeah. on that, idea, the institutional support, because yes, surely both uh, institutions, universities, governments, uh, there, there are a lot of people out there with a lot of programs. There's still a lot of volunteer programs, everything from church groups to Boy Scouts uh, mm. doing very good work. Would you, you, there's so many instances, you often have to group them as collective reports of good deeds on, on Jewish heritage. It's not a story that's just, you know, the occasional anti-Semitic or vandalism of a cemetery every day around around Europe, both in the East and the West, there are, there are hundreds of groups working to, to clean cemeteries, document them, protect and preserve them. But let me ask about institutions because you're sponsored by the Rothschild Foundation, Hanadiv, and they've been involved in this work for decades and even earlier in with heritage programs in Israel and elsewhere. Um, what other programs uh, do they have or how do you, does your work integrate with some of the other initiatives that they have for you know universities archives and that sort of thing or are you kind of your your own no. thing off to the side how do you how do you uh, coordinate your, your this your is work? a i mean the jewish heritage europe is a project of the rothschild foundation it is the it's project of the rothschild foundation um previously up until i don't want to say a few but more than a few years ago the rothschild foundation hanadith europe was also funding some Jewish heritage projects on the ground, documentation projects and things like that, where they, they've shifted their built heritage focus on Jew, to Jewish heritage Europe. And the projects that they um, fund in their, their grants, a series of grants, generally do they deal with uh, Jewish education, academics, even community building, uh, archives, libraries. It has, um, a couple of new websites that have just been launched, uh, the Yerusha Jewish Archive website, which is, you know, really has a tremendous amount of material about Jewish material in archives around Europe, and the uh, Judaica Index, which is a, like a, it's a teaching website, and it takes, I believe it's like 200 types of Judaica, provides examples of them, and gives information about them. So it's photographic as well as informational. And this, these just launched uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it, it's, it's changing, the, the, the Rothschild Foundation Hanadiv Europe is changing, it has changed its, its focus, its general focus a bit, but a lot comes under the umbrella. And it has grants, it's a grant providing institution. And the grants um, for people who want to apply for a grant, uh, the material on the website of the foundation is, is very detailed and um, will, you know, will help. It shows what they fund and what they don't fund, for example. Do you, do you think, uh, I mean, the Rothschild Foundation has changed its profile, its activities over the years. Um, even Jewish Heritage Europe evolved from this one earlier effort after, I think it was the 2004 conference in Prague. Uh, until the iteration that you now uh, edit. Do you see after 10 years of uh, your own work at uh, Jewish Heritage Europe, are there new directions that you want to go in or, or that you must go in or that you might go in? Um, how are you going to, uh, can you give us a preview of, um, of, what's, of what might come up or just are we gonna get more great stuff just as we've been getting uh, for all of these years, but new voices, well, new theme. I would, um, what I would like to see, and, and we do have some of it, um, is uh, some more in 
you know, we, we have a, there's a section called Have Your Say. And we, we have guest authors write. And many of the guest authors, or most of all of them, are either no, you know, well-known scholars, hands-on professionals. Uh, we have a poet did one. But these are really top-notch people who are, have written personal essays about an aspect of Jewish heritage, built heritage generally. And um, I would like us to have more perhaps in-depth articles like that. We have a section in the cemetery section. There's one section just about cemeteries. We have a sort of long read section where we have several articles that really provide longer, um, you know, longer treatments of certain issues regarding Jewish cemeteries, either either reports or, or whatever. But I think I would like to, um, I, I would hope for example, that people can use our newsfeed or it's a blog basically. I mean, blog technology and it can be embedded on other websites so that websites dealing with Jewish heritage or, or heritage itself can embed the news. We can embed the newsfeed, embed the blog for free and that means that they would have a constant flow of news, of updated news about, about uh, Jewish heritage issues. I think maybe I would like to get more, I mean, it's hard to say because there's, there's so much material out there that it's hard to choose what to, what to put on the site. I can't put, you know, we can't put everything. That's why, you know, we share on Facebook other articles and things, um, but I would like, you know, if possible, maybe we have more in-depth writing, uh, issue-based writing. We have a lot of issue-based material, but um, this type of thing, perhaps, but it's, I don't know. So, so um, we're gonna go to questions in a few minutes, but uh, I'm reading some of the questions coming in and some of them are the same questions that I still have for you. So I'm going to pull yeah. two of them, put them together, uh, but picking up on something you just said, because you talked about the, the writers that you have. And one of a very moving piece that was just up recently was by a colleague of ours from, from uh, Kharkiv uh, about his um, exodus really across Ukraine as he, um, as he fled. fled the fighting and, yeah. and traced uh, the route through towns that he had documented and written about for the past uh, 20, 20 years. I really recommend that read, but the two questions I wanna ask you then, and they've come up in the feed and there are questions that I wanted to ask you too, is how do you get your information? And of course you can do a pitch for people to send you information. And then yes. something very specific, what do you see right now as um, the impact uh, and the future um, impact of the war in Ukraine? So those are two unrelated questions, but they tie to Eugenie's uh, um, yeah. account. Maybe you can address those. Obviously the impact of the pandemic is very real as well. And you can also address that too. Well, I'm, you know, to, how do I get my information? I trawl the internet and people sometimes send me information and I use Facebook a lot, frankly, because there are a lot of, there are an infinite number of Facebook groups about individual sites, about um, you know institutional websites, um, and I, you know, I, I have there's a uh, I, an assistant Michele Migliore who's a PhD fellow at Bar Ilan University, and he also trawls the internet. Find we find um, we find news reports. Uh, I have Google alerts um, in in several languages about you know, Jewish heritage sites. Um, and sometimes, sometimes, and I, I emphasize sometimes people send me information and send me tips. And it would be wonderful if people would you know, send more. Um, it's, it's sort of frustrating when even good friends of mine don't send, don't send updates about their projects. But, um, so a variety of ways. Um, and then also travel, you know, I've, you know, until the, uh, now during the pandemic, 
uh, since the pandemic, I've only been able to make two long trips, uh, looking at sites and updating. And, um, but I get it on the ground. I get material on the ground also. Um, as for the impact of the war in Ukraine, it's very difficult to say because um, in Ukraine itself, uh, you know, it's, it, I know that the, uh, some projects are still going on. Uh, I, the ESJF, the European Jewish Cemeteries Initiative is still fencing cemeteries, is still reporting on their website and their social media about uh, material, uh, places that they have been working. I know some, in, at least one or two individual sites are still working, but you know, nobody knows what's going to happen there. And in the impact elsewhere in Europe, um, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody can really foresee what happens outside of Ukraine. Um, this year, two major organizations that sponsor um, cemetery, Jewish cemetery cleanups uh, have returned to mainly Poland, but also other countries after the COVID break. That's the um, Action Sunez Sun Achnan in Germany and uh, the Matseva Foundation. I don't know if Matseva Foundation will be able to work in Ukraine as they plan, but they're certainly doing a lot of work in Poland this year. And um, what I think in another one of the essays that we put on Jewish Heritage Europe regarding Ukraine, I think Magdalena Valigorska raised a, an important question about what might happen in Ukraine, but we, we don't know is will the trauma of the war and the devastation, will that somehow supplant, but will a collective memory of devastation be this current war? And will that supplant the collective memory of the, the Holocaust? So the impact, it may have an impact on researchers who are uh, researching on, on memory and, um, and, and all of that. And so the base, the bottom line is, I don't know what the impact will be. It'll be complex. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, these are, these are themes for whole discussions. And in Krakow, uh, I, I actually participated in a discussion off the side. And, you know, the question is, will this, the new trauma, uh, supplant, replace, right. suppress, you know, this recognition of the Holocaust, or will it make communities actually more understanding and more sympathetic with to what happened to their their Jewish neighbors? We just we just don't know. But uh, definitely, it's the whole war and then the rebuilding process. Assuming this war will come to an end at some point, is going to suck up resources of every sort, and whether whether that 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 will also impact cultural heritage, not just Jewish but cultural heritage. Across across the board, cultural heritage always suffers terribly uh, in wartime. Um, we know that from from the former Yugoslavia. We know it from Syria, Iraq, everywhere, and and this is going to be no. Uh, it, it, this is not going to be an exception. All right, I'm going to turn to some of the questions. Um, so let me uh, remind our audience, and I I don't see you all, but I understand there's a good crowd out there. Um, if you have questions, put them in the chat. There are already quite a few, and I'm going to try to scroll through them without <laughs> somehow turning off my, my Zoom. Um, but, uh, or, or maybe, um, I don't know whether Karen wants to uh, ask any questions at this point, uh, uh, because we can, we, can, we can open this up a lot. There, there's obviously so much more that can be, be said. Um, also, before I, before I forget though, you were saying where to get the information. You were encouraging people to send in information. And I wanna reiterate that, that that's the best source for good, new, fresh information and uh, news reports, uh, personal visit reports, contacts and photos. Uh, it may not always make it up to the site, uh, but it all goes into a kind of collective resource uh, file that many of us share. Uh, there's a great number of participants. You mentioned bar -Ilan University, Hebrew University, um, different organizations are always very active. 
And uh, also Ruth does travel. And if you feel that she is not representing your place, uh, whether it's a town or a country sufficiently um, on Jewish Heritage Europe, and you think that there's something that she should see and know, um, you know, arrange for her to come, uh, send her an invitation, uh, uh, help, help, help her, help her, uh, help her plan a trip. And, and I think you won't be uh, disappointed. We showed up uh, at a lot of places in uh, Hungary, Austria, Slovakia, Czechia, and uh, Slovenia over the past few weeks. And um, uh, we learned a lot. And I think uh, the local people where we met with them also uh, benefited from that, from that visit. Okay, so here are a few um, uh, questions. Let's see, some of them are comments. Let me see if I can read them. Oh, let me hold on a second. I just lost something here. You still I see me? I sent you questions via email, Sam. Uh, okay, can you still see me? Because I've just lost uh, seeing you. I will, I'll... Uh, go on email and ask you some of these questions. Uh, Tadej, are you hearing me? We can me? see you, we can see you. You can see me and hear me. Okay, so I'm not going to fiddle with anything. Um, okay, here's a good question. Is there a section on Jewish music on the website, Ruth? No, no, deal, we deal, <laughs> Jewish Heritage of Europe deals primarily and almost exclusively with um, Jewish built heritage. Um, but I do think there's a link to the Jewish Music Institute in London. Um, but occasionally uh, there will be, you know, uh, we'll, we'll do something about um, a concert or, or put it on the calendar, a concert or a festival or something like that, where Jewish music will be, I think will be, you know, part of the festival or the, con or the concert. But um, it's, it's primarily about, Built heritage. Right. And um, so here's a question. I, I think the answer I sort of know, but I think it offers you an opportunity to talk about some other types of documentation and where people might find other kinds of information. This is from Michal mm -hmm. Perlmutter. Uh, and and it, the common is I visited Kolki in Ukraine where my father was born. In the forest is the mass grave of the Jews of that area of the Ukraine who were murdered in the Holocaust. There's a memorial there. However, areas of the town were pointed out where Jews had lived, uh, where there was a synagogue and where the Jewish cemetery was located. None of that exists now. Is there any work done to map locations of former Jewish habitat or activity? And I think you can speak to that because we've heard about some recent activities just of that sort uh, lately. I think there Maybe are. I mean, there's a lot for of the, but for other places. Yeah. In Kolki, I don't know, but in, in, in you know, um, in, the, in the genealogy world, the Jew, Jewish genealogy world, uh, has, people have carried out a lot of mapping, either memory mapping or, or, or other types of mapping. Um, and in some, in, there are some projects, there have been some projects carried out by students in some towns um, as part of their educational programs where they do teach about, where they do use the Jewish, the built heritage to learn about their, their vanished neighbors, for example, in the Czech Republic, this project, which has been widespread. Uh, so there are some individual projects of mapping individual places. I believe in Charleston, South Carolina, there's been a big mapping of, uh, this isn't Europe, but it's a mapping, mapping of the Jewish uh, Charleston, South Carolina, which was carried out not that long ago. So there are, but I, I, there are surveys. I mean, Sam, you oversaw some of the first surveys that took, pl took place after fall of communism of locations of Jewish heritage sites in, in a number of countries, um, Poland, Czech Republic, uh, Bulgaria, et cetera, Ukraine, uh, that were carried out under the auspices of the US Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad. But within towns and cities, um, I believe there was a project in Brody in, in Ukraine carried out by a local NGO or institute several years ago, but I don't know if that continues. 
Uh, but, and, and oh, the, in Ukraine, the Center for Urban History has carried out a number of mapping projects, both in Lviv and for other places. And there's an interactive map about Lviv on their website. And it's, it's Jewish heritage as well as other heritage too. But that, that institute has, has done tremendous work in Western Ukraine, but I, I can't speak to any other, you know, their individual projects, so, I can't. So it seems to me, just like you were saying, um, it's important, you know, not to only be thinking of uh, the Holocaust as the as the sum total of Jewish history in Central and Eastern Europe, but also thinking about what came before. So we broaden our our interest in the same thing with Jewish monuments, with Jewish heritage sites. When we began, I began around 1988, 89. We were looking at synagogues, cemeteries. Uh, eventually, more and more mikvahot were discovered. But generally, we were talking about community buildings and ritual buildings. We weren't talking about the diversity of types of buildings that Jews used in their everyday lives. Obviously, schools, old age homes, hospitals, but also shops and factories and different types of residential properties, uh, even recreational properties. I mean, there's a whole range because Jews did everything that most other people did and what most people do today. And that's why we all love um, Barbara Kirschenbach Imlet's book uh, that she did with her father, uh, they call me Meyer July because he illustrates all of these wonderful, the wonderful variety of Jewish spaces and places within mm -hmm. any town. And I, I do think there, there is a shift. We're seeing this in a new generation of younger scholars, a shift to, to trying to map these places, although many of them are lost, irrevocably lost. Uh, so maybe one direction for Jewish Heritage Europe is a section. You can't do all the work, but a section with links to some of these projects, um, yeah, because have, I think that's going to broad, gonna broaden the broaden the definition of Jewish uh, heritage no, sites. We have, uh, to come. we have links to some one of the one of the projects, and I think we wrote about it too. There's a big there was a big project in Budapest about Jewish architects, buildings designed Jewish buildings, and it was in this in the central Budapest. Um, either designed by Jewish architects or used by for some by Jews, I guess. I can't remember exactly the. And that was a that was a project, you know, based on and and using a lot of work on my my friend uh, Anna Perzo, who has died um, in, in the past year or so, who had already documented the some of the downtown. Central Budapest area. She documented in a book uh, the places, the tenement houses, the the structure, the urban tapestry of the Jewish quarters in Budapest, of downtown Jewish quarters. And this was a lot of this was put on a website, um, which was launched a few years ago, which I think is still up. Um, so there are there are some projects like that, and we do link to we link to some of them at least. So another question, um, and uh, I know the answer, but I think it's it's a wonderful way to give a shout out to two pioneers in this area. Uh, from Barbara Sharloff, she asked, do you know a book called Synagogues Without Jews by Rivka and Ben Sion Dorfman? And uh, I'll say that uh, I met the Dorfmans when I was a graduate student and just beginning in this work, and they were pioneers and, and mentors to me. Um, and uh, they essentially, I guess, uh, laid some of the trails yeah. that you then followed when you wrote Jewish Heritage Europe. Yeah, I mean, I, I've never met them, um, but um, Rivka Dorf, Dorfman uh, passed away not long ago. And so we ran an obituary of her. And one of the things that we've been doing on the website also is trying to pay tribute to these pioneers because that generation is passing away. And we lost, we lost some really wonderful people over the past couple of years. Rivka Dorfman, Anna Perzel in Hungary, Jan Jagielski in Poland. Um, Maria Piechotka. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's, it's just, and, and it's, you know, there's tremendous, oh, in Ukraine, um, Grisha Arshinov, who died of COVID. I mean, there's, there's, there's a loss. I mean, he was not old, but there's a loss of 
I mean, Maria Piachotka was 100 years old, so it's really a change of demo. And we, we traveled with her and her husband in 1990. And um, they, we already could, thought they were old, but you know, <laughs> she lived to be a hundred and influenced so many people. And and you know, I often dedicate talks that I give to Yuji Fiedler, the Czech pioneer who tragically and cruelly was was murdered by someone who had asked him for help in doing something with the Jewish cemetery and he let him into his house and you know the guy killed him. So we've tried to pay tribute to these people who were our mentors or my mentors and inspirations and really try to you know try try to make it that so that their legacy lives on. And um, yeah. it's so refreshing when I see young people there you know, they're, they're at, the, at the conference in Krakow that we were at, we had a number of younger people who were speaking. And I know young people who were dynamic, like, like Victor Sorensen from the, the AEPJ, who is, has been working uh, the past couple of weeks with incubating, he calls it, incubating projects, Jewish heritage projects through the Paideia program. And has uh, oversees the European Roots of Jewish Heritage, the European Days of Jewish Heritage. These are all projects that, you know, younger people we hope are going to carry on and move forward. And, um, you know, the young people are the future. And it was refreshing to see so many young people who are becoming involved, or I hope are becoming involved, young scholars, young practitioners, young hands-on activists. And it's, um, it's exciting. It's com it continues to be exciting. Let's put it that way. That's right. Okay, so we just have a couple of minutes. Um, I think that passing the torch to another generation is very, uh, very important. I like to think that uh, you and I, we, we're the, sort of the third generation of people doing this. Maybe there are older ones in the 19th century, but there was a very active generation in the interwar years um, who documented many of these sites, and that's why we know about so many of the places that were destroyed. And these are people that the Piachotkas and others always dedicated their works to, always mentioned in their lectures, always gave credit that they stood on the shoulders of these, uh, these pioneers, Simon Sijak, other people. Um, I feel that we stand on the shoulders of people like Iggy Fiedler and, and uh, Jan Nigelski and, and Annie Sesher Doty and all these other people. Um, who did so much work uh, in documenting things in isolation. And I think it's very heartening to go to conferences. I was just at a conference in Budapest on the art of the Holocaust. And then we were at the Krakow conference and I definitely felt like an oldster uh, <laughs> of the, the, uh, the old generation because there were, there were a lot of very dynamic, very brilliant, um, energetic, enthusiastic, talented, uh, people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who are deeply immersed in this field. And I, I'm very heartened that the work that, that you've done, that I've done, and many of our colleagues will you know, continue to be developed um, with setbacks, always setbacks, but, but I, think, um, I think that's really important. And Jewish Heritage Europe is this incredible portal. So a lot of people have asked, how do I find out about sites and go to visit them and things like that? Jewish Heritage Portal, uh, Jewish Heritage Europe is not a tourism site, but it does give you a lot of information, a lot of great places you will want to visit, but then you'll have to go on to other sites, uh, Jewish communities, governments, local municipalities, they all have a lot of tourist information today. Um, and other people have asked, how do you manage all the data? That's another project. Uh, you don't do the all the tech work, but um, it's, it's a big project to manage, uh, to manage that too, um, but... Um, right. I just want to say one thing that, uh, you know, Bay, I'm not, you know, Jewish Heritage Europe is not trying to reinvent the wheel. And um, for the countries, we do not have on, for each country, a totally comprehensive list of all the Jewish heritage sites in it, in those countries. We, we link to links. We link to websites where you will be able to find this or much of that information. I, we don't want to duplicate 
the work that other people have done. Um, and so there are a lot of there are a lot of links, and I, you know, mea culpa, I know there are a lot of dead links at the moment too, probably, which are constantly, constantly needing updating. But uh, we, you know, we, we want people to understand or to see how much is out there. And there's a tremendous amount out there. It, the site is also fully searchable through keyword. So if you're interested in a, in a place, you can, you know, search for it if you want to visit it and see what we have. We don't have, you know, not necessarily we don't have material on everything, but um, you may be able to find a link. And you know, every, every post, every article it contains links where the information comes from. It's like footnotes. I'm a big believer in footnotes. I love footnotes. And so the hyperlinks are like footnotes where you can go and click and get more. And um, yeah, so take a look. And I'd well, like- I to think our hour is up. I think our hour is up. Carol, do you want to uh, close us yeah, out? Yeah, sorry. I just realized you can't you can't see me. Um, this has been really fascinating. And actually, you preempted my question about the next generation. Um, through the work we do in Geshe Leeropa, we really are trying to harness educators and to encourage not just an appreciation of, of the materials that the library has, but of Jewish heritage um, in general and to make younger people feel bought in to what is around them in their own surroundings, not just to consume the, the packages and the materials that we're trying to create. So it really is a two-way street. And in, indeed, we're looking at people to document what they're doing now in their Jewish lives. That's just as much a part of the Jewish story as the materials that we might have from decades ago or centuries ago. Um, there have been some, I really uh, want to thank both of you. This has been a fascinating conversation to eavesdrop into and also um, thank all the participants for their very interesting questions and, and some messages here that I hope that we can continue and take into our other, other conversations. So thank, thank you both very, very much. But thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Sam. And uh, Lana Tov and good night from Jerusalem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you Bye -bye. for coming. Thank you. Have a good night.